Hey, welcome. It's September 3rd, 2012, and you're watching and listening to another Nerdstalker Tech Week update, number 37 by my count. I'm Greg Voria, a.k.a. Social Greg on Twitter, and you are? I am Adolfo Ferranda at Nerdstalker on Twitter. Good to see you, Greg, and everyone out there. Hey. Hello. H Happy Labor Day. Happy Labor Day. Working? Happy Bruce, <laughs> what is it, Bruce Willis Day. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> oh yeah, we got a lot of good story on that one. I think yeah. you're going to lead us into that one. That's but, right. Uh, wow, very cool, very cool. Yeah, so Greg, let's Welcome. get into it, man. Yes. Um, Windows eight tablets, man. This, you know, everyone's been talking about these things. What's happening? Oh uh, yeah. Hey, but I we only listen to ARS Technica for this type of stuff. Peter Bright, thank you for this <laughs> article. Uh, the not very tablety Windows eight tablets of IFA. So uh, this week, uh, the IFA show in Berlin showed off a horde of Windows eight devices, uh, which Social Greg is now labeling as laplets. Just remember that. Yeah. I got hey, the copyright that's good. on that. Trademark, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, lots of Windows 8, uh, Windows RT machines. We're on the show at IFA in Berlin this week. Uh -huh. Yeah, you, know, you like that. <laughs> so, <laughs> hey, I got to do I something. I like it. I like uh, it. Yeah. Uh, so clamshore keyboard docks uh, adorn many of these tablets coming out this uh, this last week. So these keyboard docks typically include extra ports, extra batteries, uh, most uh, importantly of all, a hinge. Mm -hmm. So the screen could be positioned at mm -hmm. any angle relative to the keyboard. Mm -hmm. And you could shut them up and use them just like laptops. Uh, mm -hmm. So you could call them tablets, keyboard docks, and keyboard docks. Mm -hmm. But, you know. Be forgiven for calling them laptops with tear-off screens. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, Asus uh, describing its transformer book as exactly that, uh, tear-off screens. Quite a difference between a convertible laptop and a dockable tablet isn't clear. So, I, 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 you know, it's interesting. I, I don't know if this is a trend or is just something that uh, I think, uh, you know, Microsoft and their buddies have just come up with to try to market against, uh, you know, the... The Apple, uh, yeah, I yeah, wonder how tablets. much these things will take off because I know way back in the day, the couriers, they tried something very similar to this. You know, it was a writing tablet. Right, uh, right. It was a laptop with a swivel right. screen and you could, you had a stylus and you could, you know, write on it and they failed miserably. Um, and they're, they're bigger than, than, than uh, tablets. You know, they're thicker, you know, because they, ha they have to comprise of, it's a full on computer, like our serious computer running full windows right, right, um in right. in a non rt um scenario um and you got that keyboard too um so there seems to be yeah like you said these two models right of the swivel screen or the tear off right or it's kind of essentially yeah. a dock you know the ipad now has a, a dock that you can dock into a keyboard accessories right, right? right. um Right. So yeah, I mean that seems to be two two options. It looks really interesting. I mean the technology's gotten much better. Thinner batteries issues are still an issue. Yeah. Um, heat is still an issue. So we'll we'll have yes. to see. And you know we haven't seen. I mean it's all kind of vaporware right now. I'm I mean they're gonna make them. They're gonna release them. But we have yet to see real performance benchmarks and stuff like that. But there's all kinds of right. crazy claims in terms of numbers. But we'll see. Well, I, I think this was the right show to kind of bring out these things. Mm -hmm. um, I think Microsoft, you know, did a great job marketing the coordination of all mm -hmm. these things at yeah. the show, I yeah. thought. You know, I mean, they were in the background, but it, obviously, you know, they talked to all their, their, their partners and said, hey, you know, this is probably the best way to, to market against the yeah. the tablets. Right, you know? right. You know? What's really ironic, too, is after the Samsung ruling, too, all of a sudden you see Samsung embracing <laughs> Windows 8 and, uh, no, <laughs> and uh, just releasing a bunch of these. You know, they make everything. They, they make everything, people. I mean, all kinds of stuff, crazy equipment and, and non-tablet and computer-related stuff. But uh, now they're going to make it for every operating system. as Well, Windows 8, I should say, for sure, too, as well as uh, Android. But it's, it's interesting how buddy-buddy how they've become, uh, Microsoft well, and Windows Samsung. Windows Phone, yeah. Oh my God! I, you know, and Samsung's gonna be fine. Yeah, right. they're gonna lose a little bit of money. Their stock went down, but they'll be fine. Yeah, yeah. So I think uh, Samsung's gonna be just just fine, like I said. And I think that um, you know, I read a couple articles this week that you know, it, it, they actually capitalized on copying, right? Yeah. So yeah, yeah. So. <laughs> Yeah. You know the 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 fee they got against themselves right. was far less than what they they got on the investments. So, right, right. I absolutely yeah, agree fine. with the ruling. Um, that being said, uh, there was a very interesting thought piece that I know uh, a lot of people have brought up that someone wrote about. Uh, it was just the cost of doing business. They realized that um, they're going to you know they, they're falling behind. Everyone's falling behind. Apple was running away with this with this uh, with the cell phone market or, or the smartphone market and. 
yeah. hey, let's just let's just outright copy it, <laughs> pretty much. And uh, Scott, what's a billion dollars between a what a forty fifty billion dollar uh, you know profit, right? So. Oh yeah, I, I I mean if you ever been to Korea, uh, Samsung is Korea. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they're, they're oh yeah, everything yeah. like you said. So. Well, they won their case in so. Korea, right? So there you go. What's what's this next story that we have, my friend? jQuery now runs on every second website. That's pretty interesting. Yeah, news. this is ama- This is amazing for all you uh, front end dev nerds out there, and and just in general, um, uh, statistically. Uh, thank you to uh, Matthias Gelbman of uh, W three Techs uh, for this information. So, what he says, you could argue. Wow. Uh, you could argue successfully that jQuery ushered in an era of uh, JavaScript awesome, uh, awareness and dominance and awesomeness, in my opinion. Um, <laughs> but uh, um, uh, be it the developer-friendly CSS, selector ask uh, Dom Kring, or the mind-boggling number of plugins and resulting ecosystem that sprung around it, um, jQuery has been adopted a massive portion of the web only seven years after the initial idea. This is really fast adoption when you think of it. Only seven years after the initial idea, the jQuery library now runs on every second website an incredible achievement in the last year every four minutes one of the top one million sites started to use jquery it was uh the fastest growing web technology in 2011 this is a very little known quiet sort of statistic that's been like in you know in the underpinning of all this just surging and uh there's no sign of saturation yet is what he's saying when they uh, compare this with other technologies that enable webmasters to build interactive websites, uh, we see, for example, Flash at 23.1% usage rate and Silverlight at a pathetic 0.3%, 0.3%. That shows that selectors in JavaScript are probably not a bad idea, right? And there are, of course, other JavaScript libraries that in many ways compete with jQuery. Other libraries offer different concepts, functionality, but uh, the 88.3% market share of jQuery seems to indicate that jQuery delivers what many webmasters need. Um, so many of the sites use more than one JavaScript library. Um, see their survey on multiple JavaScript library usage. One interesting fact is that uh, that sites that use other popular libraries very often use jQuery as well. So like uh, 49% of forty nine percent of uh, MooTools, that's another jQuery library, sites that use um, also use jQuery, and 49% of prototype sites do as well. Um, prototype is nice. another JavaScript library also. So the, in conjunction with nice. their libraries, they also use jQuery as well. Uh, that's almost the same as uh, the overall u- jQuery usage rate. So the fact that a uh, site uses MooTools or Prototype doesn't does not reduce the likelihood that it uses jQuery. Um, so the stats tell us that jQuery now runs on every other website, as, as mentioned. Amazing, considering it's been roughly seven years since its inception. And it's even more amazing considering mm. the sheer number of websites out there in the general public. So um, hats off to John Resig and the team at uh, that, that create uh, jQuery. And, and thanks to Microsoft and uh, Apple and everyone, whoever has been uh, supporting and, and the browser vendors for supporting jQuery as well. It's really helped us to make some amazing uh, web apps, websites, etc. Very nice. Very nice. Now, I, everyone, every developer I talk to loves jQuery. So Yeah, good yeah. stuff. So, Greg, tell me about this. Uh, Google can now automatically tag objects within video. This is, sounds like amazing technology, man. Oh, this is really cool. Uh, he thanks to uh, PSFK uh, for the Twitter feed that got me onto this story and Gadget, who actually wrote the story. Um, so instead of asking the creator to label objects every time, you know how much of a pain in the butt that is, uh, Google pro- uh, proposes in, in a, uh, using a database of feature vectors such as color, movement, shape, texture to automatically identify objects in the frame through their common traits, um, a cat's ear, fast movement that would separate it from a ball of yarn. Uh, you know, movie makers themselves can provide a lot of underlying material just by naming and tagging enough of their clips, uh, which makes it more searchable, obviously. So, uh, you know, this was really a through a patent a, uh, that was granted to Google just recently. So that's how Engadget kind of picked up on this. And, you know, this is a potential time saver when it comes to uploading, you know, the 12th consecutive pet video that you have or something like that, you know, another Maru cat video or something like that, right. you know. Um, so, I, I, you know, I thought it was kind of cool. Some of the things I said, you know, in, in the video, you know, poll, you know, cat, dog, yeah. whatever, you know. I mean, it's just kind of interesting. I, I, you can actually just tag directly on the video. I mean, you know, before you just had to just put manual tags just to make sure it's searchable. But now 
Oh, it's in the video? Wow, that's crazy. Yeah, that's insane, man. But let's talk yeah. about your next thing, working from home. Boost productivity by working from home. What's what's up with yeah, that? Yeah, yeah. So I've been really interested in like productivity solutions and in podcasts and things like that lately. And this this article kind of struck me too because um, I've talked to people who work from home about this sort of issue before and, it, and, it, and this guy sort of resonated, it captured it. So yeah, uh, thanks to Forbes, Steve Cooper, the uh, contributor for writing mm. the story. Uh, when he first began working from home, he says he had a big problem. He didn't know how to shut it down. He would wake up immediately, jump on the computer, and have to get pulled away late at night by his wife. Uh, apparently, he's not used to, you know, he's not alone in this uh, boost of productivity, as you know. Mm. Uh, he bumps mm. into people all the time who wonder how he's able to get anything done at home. They often suggest uh, they'd be mm. too, too, too distracted by their comfortable surroundings. Uh, they might be surprised uh, then by a recent s- uh, survey out of Brown University, which found a 12% increase in performance for a randomly selected group of 255 call center employees who volunteered to work from home. Uh, The performance Hmm. boost was an 8.5% increase in the number of minutes worked per shift and a 3.5% increase in the performance they squeezed out per the minutes they worked. Uh, Where the study gets really interesting, however, is in the job satisfaction portion. Uh, At-home workers had a substantially higher job satisfaction uh, compared to those who were not able to work at home, and their job attrition rates dropped a whopping 50%. So you would think these workers would never give up working from home, right? Wrong. Mm-hmm. Uh, after the experiment, nearly half of the employees changed their minds and returned to the office, and two-thirds of the employees who wanted to work from home changed their mind. See, this, this is what I've heard, too, quite a bit, too. What's missing is the com- camaraderie, is what they say, and the human interaction. Uh, disruptions is actually one of the reasons the authors of the study believe productivity goes down when in an office. Um, his tips for keeping your sanity uh, working from home, he says, is number one, schedule. He's got three tips, right? So schedule yeah. uh, face-to-face meetings. Number two, learn how to get the day going and to shut it down. And number three, he says, uh, create a rhythm to your day. So what that means is just about every morning and afternoon, he moves, uh, you know, the same for him. Uh, he has a work ritual when he checks his emails, when he engages social networks, plows through emails, writes columns, and so on. Uh, prioritize the ind- the importance of tasks and give lenience to drop and uh, or short- shorten a task if falling behind. By repeating mm. this process day in and day out, like a quarterback feeling the pressure in the pocket, you know when you're ahead of schedule and when falling behind. Of course, when all else fails, if you really want to skew the pro- those pro- productivity numbers, there's always the weekend to catch up. So what was really interesting uh, is the point about the job satisfaction, you know, or the satisfaction from working at home and and how people feel lonely. It's weird because I've met these contractors who, you know, you know, Greg, you've been like independent contractor and that kind of thing before. Yeah. What's your experience with that? Well, I I, I think what it is is that I I agree with the distraction at work. I know my productivity, um, especially if you're in a position of management um, where people are almost like uh, asking you something almost like you feel every minute. Um, When when you're away from that, you can focus a lot more. Um, Mm -hmm. I think the the, the thing he brought up is just some kind of discipline. because sometimes it's just easy to say, mm. wow, I'm, I feel like I'm on vacation. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah, know, yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, I'll just roll, you know, with my slippers and you know, just kind of go onto the couch. But uh, mm-hmm. I, I think that... Um, or it's the opposite, though, too. Sure. You know, when you're like, you're in your robes and slippers and you just can't stop putting your laptop away and you're just working, working, working. Yeah. You're hanging out with someone yeah. at your house, your wife or whatever, and you're just still working, working, working. I, I think one of the tricks, you know, at our at our company also is is this connectivity, um, making sure, you know, we use IM th- things like Skype mm. to make sure that we can talk to the person, mm. at least, you know, interrupt them a little bit mm-hmm. without being in the office. So there's other mm-hmm. tools like that mm-hmm. that allow us to make sure that we can connect with the mm. uh, work from home people. But, yeah, I mean, I, I think people are still trying to figure out how to do it, but, you know, people have been doing it for years, so it is possible, and, you know, independent contractors like realtors have been doing it for ages, right? Right, so, right, yeah. Um, you know, it's just these electronic devices are the ones that are the ball and chain to us, right? right. <laughs> so, well, Greg, wow. on to uh, sexier, yes. sexier car stories here. BMW, yes. DriveNow program, rolls out in San Francisco. Uh, tell us more about this. 
Well, thanks to the official blog of BMW for this and SFGate blog uh, blogger uh, Michael uh, Cabana Tuan. I hope I got that name right. But um, and <laughs> you know, while you were on vacation, my friend, yeah. a press conference was held at City Hall, San Francisco City Hall, uh, on August 20th, uh, where the BMW officials joined Mayor Ed Lee and uh, city environmental officials to announce two new programs that aim to establish the German luxury car makers' credentials as a company that supports sustainability as well as broaden the reach into other parts of the transportation market. Uh, the car sharing program known as Drive Now allows people to enroll uh, to use BMW's 70 car fleet of active E all electric cars. And I, I didn't realize that uh, BMW had a great program like that. Now parked at 14 locations around the city. Um, the cars cost $12 for the first hour, get this, at 32 cents each additional minute. So you better be a little bit careful what you want to do with these cars. But uh, I'd like uh, the various two other car sharing programs, you know, uh, the nonprofit, uh, uh, I guess, uh, City Car Share and uh, the for-profit Zipcar, as we all know it. Uh, Drive Now allows the drivers to take a car from one point to another and just leave it. Actually, so that's kind of cool. Uh, Oakland International Airport is already a location, and uh, a site at SFO will be expected pretty soon. So, uh, you know, hey, and also, I think one of the interesting things is BMW is also going into the parking business. So, get your app, apps ready for this, uh, people. Get your phones and, and ready. There's now a park, there will be a launching a park now app, which allows you to reserve a parking space in the city. Can you imagine that? Um, and it allow the drivers to kind of just, uh, you know, search for parking places and garages that are only part of that program. But, hey, you could get real-time information. You could figure out the cost, availability. You could reserve it. I mean, it's probably time now that the city's density has gotten worse and worse now that, you know, we need to do something like that. Yeah. So, hey, I like this article that you have next coming up. Now, Bruce Willis may sue Apple over rights to his iTunes library. Yeah, I, I saw that this morning, and I said, ah, man, and then you picked it yeah, up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead and talk about There's that. been a lot of talk about this kind of this notion of uh, what happens to your stuff after you pass away, right? And, uh, and of course, it's Bruce Willis who takes the, you know, the helm and, and uh, popularizes the story, uh, which raises this interesting conversation. Um, so thanks to Dan Graziano for writing this piece at Boy Genius Reports. He says, digital, digital downloads have made purchasing content on the internet remarkably easy, right? So each year, millions of people purchase games, movies, software uh, through iTunes, right? Steam and other digital platforms. The majority of people are unaware that most of the content they purchase isn't actually theirs. Uh, however, as non-transferable licenses impose many restrictions on how people can use the content they download. So uh, one Hollywood A-lister has had enough of these licenses and uh, is considering legal action against Apple over the rights to his iTunes library. The Daily Mail reported Bruce Willis was hoping to give his vast digital music collection to his children upon his death. Um... But such an act is illegal, according to Apple's Terms of Service Agreement. The actor is reportedly weighing his legal options against the Cupertino-based company and may actively support proposed legislation in five U.S. states that aim to give downloaders more rights to their digital content. Ooh. Now, you know, we think about this, like back in the day, I mean, record albums, even CDs, right? You can just uh, bequeath these things to your loved ones and, you know, you know how... With this world of digital downloads and this time, these times yeah. of restrictive uh, terms yeah. of service agreements, you know, what what can you do? There is it seems like no one's thought about this, and a lot of a lot of companies aren't commenting on it uh, as reporters are inquiring. You know, so it's it's a, a sticky situation here. So. Well, dude, it's time for a speed round. Speed round. Speed round. Speed round. I love that. So, story, Greg, man. what is this? Uh, Korean scientists. Yes. Tell us more about this. I'm very oh, interested in this story. I, they said that, uh, yeah, Korean scientists may have found the lithium battery charging holy grail. Nice. Uh, so this is from Advanced Tech KR from Korea. You know, Samsung's had a pretty tough time there in Korea, but, you know, Korean <laughs> researchers still are playing up with innovative ways to help us here. So uh, apparently, uh, you know, the lithium ion batteries in electrical vehicles, you know, like the Honda, uh, uh, Ford Focus, just take hours to recharge, right, with this lithium battery recharge. Uh, we're charging stuff. Yeah. So let, let's, you know, uh, these guys from uh, one of the National Institutes of Science and Technology in Korea uh, have uh, found a material.
Basically, that allows you to fast charge a lithium ion battery that up to 30 to 120 times faster. So, of course, this is the infant stage and it is in the research stage. So, you know, we're probably six years away from this. But I thought it was interesting that, you know, someone actually is focused really well on this and, you know, it's become more and more of an issue. So, yeah, you know, part of the problem for electrical electric vehicles is just, you know, I think I don't consider them because, uh, one, I need to find a port to charge them at. And, and two, they just take a long ass time. And, and so there was this, this, this report I read recently that, you know, even if you go to work and let's say it's an eight hour day, nine hour day, or however you want to call it, it barely gets you to almost full charge. So you're on this constant, like, you know, every day you'll be decreasing, <laughs> you oh, know, yeah. until you can put it at home, right? right. Um, and it, it isn't at that point yet where you could actually just get a fast charge and then leave, you know, because most of our errands, you know, if you think about it, uh, you know, are, are less than an hour at best. And so, you know, you have to make sure that you have at least eight hours of errands going to go. Gonna go. And, but I think the hybrid cars are still the best way to go right now until they can figure out this problem. So mm. anyway. Let's go on to the next one. Um, your Andrino powered bartender. I thought that was so cool. Uh, that's so maker. <laughs> yeah. So uh, what we're calling it is the inebriator. So yeah. <laughs> so it's an incredible Arduino powered bartender. Thanks to life hacker uh, Shep McAllister for this article. Um, it's uh, an it's a brilliant cocktail serving appliance that can autonomous autonomously <laughs> mix fifteen dr- different pre-programmed drink recipes and what's so awesome about this is that if you want to build your own inebriator uh the creators posted a basic overview of the parts to their blog but not the list of instructions uh you could probably get more information at this point i think there's a lot of interest in this thing at uh, www.theinebriator.com so check it out really cool uh usage of fun fun usage of our arduino technology and uh for all you home like programmers out there and hackers out there you'll you'll have a lot of fun with this one Hey, Greg, speed round. Make our fair to the two. Yes. Let's go back birthday. to happy birthday, Linux. Uh, raise a glass. Yay. Hey, um, uh, August 25th is the day traditionally used as their anniversary date. And um, last year was their 20th anniversary. So as you know, here in the United States, the 21st birthday is a significant milestone. So the, the Linux uh, penguin hits adulthood uh, <laughs> last week and uh, can start drinking uh, using nice. that inebriator that you just found yeah, out there. there. You go, so, there you go. Uh, I thought uh, that was a milestone that you always talked to me about Linux operating systems, so I thought I had to bring that yeah, up this Yeah, thanks. Week, that's, so. a great, that's a great find. <laughs> okay, what's next? Uh, next one, TextMate. Uh, the amazing IDE has went GPL3 open source. So uh, in the recent deluge of editors, IDEs, and cloud things, it's safe to say that TextMate has lost a lot of mind share, uh, especially to Sublime Text 2 for all you, uh, you know, developers out there who know this. Uh, well, its developers have gone and ahead and open source the entire thing it's a uh, os 10 only so mac aficionados hit the github repo which we will include the link here down below here or uh, if you're listening check the show notes uh and for the github re- repo link and dig it it's really great application text uh text mate nice so great nice. next nice. one speed speed round. Well, here's the car speed round. Oh, cool. Uh, California moves on driverless cars. How do you like that? No, so it's... thanks to SF Business uh, News uh, Twitter feed and cool. uh, Michael Rosenbring of the San Jose Merck. Uh, so California last Wednesday stepped on the accelerator <laughs> towards futuristic highway filled with robot cars. Okay. as the legislature sent to, yeah, Governor Jerry Brown, a bill that would allow driverless vehicles to hit the road later in this decade. So oh, I thought, you know, yeah, I, I think this is really cool because I think they'll need to start testing these. But but, you know, apparently I read that, um, you know, they, they've tested, they logged 300,000 yeah. miles with the yeah, guy Yeah, they've been testing this actively. Guy. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. So, well, I thought, you know, this yeah. is great news because I thought quite the opposite would happen. You know, seeing what happened to Segway and how California moved yeah. against Segway so aggressively that it's encouraging to see them moving forward on this, this wonderful technology. I think uh, we should move on this as soon as possible. That's great. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Let's, let's move Tip on. Tip time. Tip time, tip time, tip time. All right, Greg, what's your tip of the week? <laughs> Greg's tip of the oh, week. Oh, man. You, you and I are music aficionados, and we played in rock bands. We played in a lot of uh, different types of bands That's that right. we probably don't want to admit to on the air here. <laughs> but um, <laughs> I am not signing any autographs, Marshall, people. Nice try. Yeah, yeah I know. <laughs> well, he, has a, he has a golden voice, just like the golden <laughs> frog, my friends. Right. But anyway, um, Marshall. 
everyone knows Marshall. Yes. You know, you see, um, yeah. So, so Marshall first stab at home audio will rock your apartment hard. Awesome. So this was from Gizmodo. Uh, thank you, Jamie uh, Condlip, for that. Uh, you know, I remember a stack behind Peter Townsend. And Peter Townsend is trashing his guitar right through the amp. Well, well, you'll have exactly a chance to get that. Uh, the 50th anniversary for um, Marshall uh, g- g- is now launching a thing called a Hanwell, the uh, active loudspeaker designed to split out your rock music or whatever audio device you want to feed it. So if you're wondering, uh, the name comes from uh, Jim Marshall, the founder of Marshall's mm-hmm. uh, first ever shop. So. Hey, look for that at the end of the year. Put that on your uh, Christmas list. And, man, you'll have a Marshall stack right behind you. Maybe I should put one right nice. behind us. So Watch out, go. Sonos. Yeah. Here comes Marshall's. Awesome, man. That's good. There you go. There you go. All Dude, right. Dude, what's your tip? So, yeah, ExoBrain. It's a mind mapping application. A free. And what's cool about uh, ExoBrain is that it's free. And it's a mind mapping web app brainstorming tool that lets you visualize your thoughts. Find unique connections between words and pushes past obvious ideas. People are using this... Um, for uh, brainstorming things, mind mapping exercises, that kind of thing. It's really cool. Uh, typically, I use something called MindJet's Mind Mapper, but it's very expensive, uh, and it's a client side. They do have web-based solution, but the ExoBrain is free. It's brand new, and so far, I haven't seen a a sort of limit to it whatsoever. So it seems like you can create as many wow, uh, maps cool. as you want. Uh, you know, right. it's, it seems like a single usage thing that you just use for yourself. Um, I suppose you could somehow share your screen if you want to, some with some other technology, or print it out. Um, but check it out. You know, go check out right. ExoBrain.com. That's exobrain.com. We got some events coming up, huh? Yeah. Uh, oh, and some new tech, tech September right 12th. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Now, Mine, Devium, Alphan Industries, Social POV, uh, Rursi, Resdy. Resdy. I, you know, <laughs> Resdy. Uh, sorry. Rursi. I love that I Greg know. always gets stuck I, with the crazy names. He, the, he's always responsible for having to say in, stuff. That's challenging. Well, the uh, I got the inebriator in the back. Inebriator, so. yeah. <laughs> it's in your contract, too. Don't make Adolfo yeah, say yeah, tough things. Is. Uh, tell us about FailCon. Yeah, FailCon. This is October 22nd, 2012. This year at the Julia Mo- Morgan Ballroom. It's a lovely place in San Francisco, downtown San Francisco. Highly recommend going, uh, recommend going to this. So FailCon is an amazing tech conference for like entrepreneurs and business people. Uh, they're going to have fantastic speakers. Uh, ben Hu, uh, nice. founder and CEO of Cheeseburger, is going to be there, Braden Cowitz, nice. uh, design partners at Google Ventures, Cindy Alvarez, director nice. of user experience at Yammer, um, just all kinds of like amazing speakers and stuff like that. So I definitely uh, check it out. Go to thefailcon.com, thefailcon.com, October 22nd in San Francisco. Really cool. Okay. Well, I think last up, uh, we're now the, I guess, the media supporter of the Trans Bay, Trans Bay Fest. All right. And come to the Trans Bay Fest opening night. Uh, you know, you'll see uh, uh, cool. th- this. We wrote about this, I guess, last month. We had a inter- uh, long interview with uh, Andre uh, Champagne, who's the uh, kind of founder of this. Uh, there's an opening night party uh, at the Supper Club SF. If you ever been to the Supper Club SF, it's a pretty cool place. Um you know, uh, you know, you'll be able to. I think what they're going to show at uh, about 10:30 uh, or that night, it's going to last till about two in the morning, my friends. You know, nine to two or something like that. There's a, a sci-fi thriller, uh, Lost Children, that kind of uh, tells a story of Evelyn Hamilton, a New York City socialite who turned to uh, turned would-be messiah. So th- there's going to be a lot of th- interesting things going on with this Cramps Bay Fest. It's kind of like the South by Southwest of the West. Um, you know, you'll see a lot of uh, uh, augmented reality type demonstrations, um, you know, and uh, I think it'd be kind of cool for uh, Dolphin and I to be a part of it. It's, well, I guess we're going to be yeah, busy that it's weekend. Great. It's going to go be like Maker Fair. So. Absolutely. So uh, click on our link and uh, it'll take you right there to get those tickets for the opening night as well as uh, you'll hear um, all of future stuff that we're going to put on there about uh, the three-day fest, I think, three or four-day fest that they're planning. So anyway. So just a reminder, everyone, if you want to contribute stories to the show, use the hashtag on Twitter, uh, Twitter, N-R-D-S-D-K, please. And you can check us out at nerdstalker.com. Go to iTunes. Take the easy route. Just subscribe to the audio or video (sighs) podcast, whatever you want. Give us a five-star rating, please. That would really help us out. Or check us out at YouTube. You know, do a search for Nerdstalker TV, Nerdstalker TV, all one word, and you will find our stuff there. Um, um, and also we have the 24 by 7 channel at iBroadcast.tv that's rocking it all the time. Uh, we're also on yes. Stitcher, too, so you go to Stitcher and subscribe to the podcast there as well. Um, anything else, Greg? I am Adolfo Ferranda. You can find me at NerdStalker on Twitter. You can email me at AdolfoNerdStalker.com. Greg, you. Hey. 
catch me on Twitter on at Social Greg, or you can email me at socialgreg at nerdstalker.com. Hey, man, it's been a great podcast again, as always. All right, see you guys next week. Thanks for listening and watching. Okay, be careful out there. <laughs>